Okay, hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to you from the UK. It's really cold, so I hope you guys are all warm and cosy because I'm freezing here. Um, I'm Heather Thorpe, and I'm from JustStyle.com. Um, if you you're not familiar with Just Style, um, then we're an online uh, news uh, online publisher of global news analysis and intelligence, and we serve the apparel, textile, and footwear industry. It's just a very quick potted version for you. So thanks again to everybody for joining uh, today's expert webinar, which is brought to you by Alvanon, and it's called Success in Today's Plus Size Market. Um, I'll soon be handing you over to today's speakers, but before I do, I've always got a, a nice little list of housekeeping points that I'll just bring to your attention. Um, as I mentioned just a little few minutes ago, um, following today's presentation, there is going to be a live Q&A which uh, it will be around 10 or 15 minutes. So if you'd like to send us your questions, we can put these to our speakers during that session. Um, you can do that, as I mentioned, uh, in the uh, questions box that's in your GoToWebinar menu panel. As I say, unfortunately, you can't directly speak to the um, our pres presenters today, but I can do that for you. So please send me your questions. Um, if we don't get time to answer all of your questions, which normally happens, um, then we will pass them directly through to Alvanon and they'll respond to you offline and hopefully ask, uh, answer your question for you then. I'm going to be available during the presentation if you do have any queries or technical issues, um, so you can contact me through the chat box. Um, finally, there will be a, a recording of today's uh, webinar. It's happening as we speak. Um, including the Q&A session, and this will then be made available to you um, to view again on uh, JustStyle.com, which is www.just-style.com, and that will be hopefully within a week. Um, if you've already registered, which of course you have, the link will be sent to you directly from GoToWebinar, um, so you'll be able to watch it again at your leisure and share it with your colleagues, etc. So. Um, I'm just going to introduce you very quickly to today's speakers and tell you a little bit about them. Um, so our speakers for this event are, as you can see on your screen, the lovely Don Howard and Alice Rodriguez. Um, and today they're going to combine their unparalleled experience and training in alternative sizing to present on current opportunities um, of the plus size sector and the most effective strategies for success in this complex and underserved market. So, Don Howard is the executive director at Alvanon. He joined the company uh, back in 2010 as a consultant and was named executive director of its global consulting team in 2013. He heads Alvanon's team of consumer insights analysts and business strategists and established the group's renowned professional development series of training workshops and seminars. Don has also played a pivotal role in Alvanon's, uh, Alvanon's evaluation, um, sorry, evolution into a highly respected consultancy group. With over 30 years of experience in apparel wholesale, vertical retail, design and manufacturing, he has worked closely with many of the world's foremost apparel organizations, helping their technical design and product development teams improve, streamline and align key practices and processes. He previously served as Vice President of Technical Design for Ann Taylor, where he established and maintained excellence in product development and quality. His responsibilities included global technical organization, selection development of talent and employee improvement programs in the technical design arena. Prior to Ann Taylor, Don was the Senior Director of Technical Design and Quality Assurance for Retail Brand Alliance and was pre-production manager for Ellen Tracy. Earlier in his career, he served as a production manager for the couture houses of Pauline Teagear and Arnold Scassi. Um, so I'll bring you on to um, Alice Rodriguez, as she is a senior consultant who joined Alvanon in 2011 after spending over 35 years in the apparel industry. Her expertise encompasses garment construction, pattern making and fit development, in addition to product development and technical design. 
Having held both line and management positions in global manufacturing operations, she brings proven strategies and solutions to the complex tasks of garment standardization, fit and manufacturing processes. So before we start, here's a fun fact for you. Alice and Don combined have over 60 years of experience in plus size. So you can't get much better than today's speakers to learn a, a thing or two from. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Don, who will uh, begin today's presentation, and I'll be back with you for the Q&A. Heather, thank you so much, um, and thank you for the introduction, although it was probably a little too long, but I appreciate that. Um, and thanks to all of you who have joined our webinar today. Um, uh, really, really important for us. This has been a very passionate subject for both Alice and I uh, for many years is uh, the plus size market. And today, you know, there's just no shortage of surveys, uh, data, financial metrics that quantify, you know, opportunities that exist in plus size and, and certainly not just in the U.S., but in many other countries around the world as well. And, you know, in our work, in our consulting practice, with clients, this subject over the past five years has really been uh, one of the most dynamic things that we've talked about with our clients uh, and, and, and also uh, most dynamic in terms of change and, and innovation. So um, what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, uh, give you an overview of the types of subjects we're gonna be talking about today. We hope that this is very informative for you. Um, I think it's always important to start at the beginning and understand uh, what is the historic evolution of plus size apparel and, and how does that lead to where we are today? Um, data is so important today in business. Um, all of us have uh, data, data is available and it's used very importantly to help um, craft and define and hone in on business strategy. Uh, so data is a very important part of our daily lives and how we help our clients achieve their uh, strategic objectives. So, you know, what does that data tell us about this evolving market? Uh, Alice is going to share some of the insight uh, tools and tips and strategy recommendations that we see and that we've had experience with in the plus size market. And also, uh, you know, maybe uh, look at some of the other opportunities in uh, the plus size market that we might not be uh, seeing right away, but, but certainly things you want to consider um, as your businesses explore uh, strategies in this area. So the history and evolution of plus size apparel, the thing that, to note here that I think is important is this simply it's just not new. Uh, it always amazes me really when clients are talking about it as though it's a brand new subject. Um, but truly a uh, plus size product uh, in women's apparel uh, was developed over 90 years ago. And it might be hard to believe, but you know, at the same time when there was a rise in um, ready to wear manufacturing and a certain sizing standard was set into place. There were people who just simply did not fit what was considered uh, regular size clothing. And as early uh, as the 1920s, um, this started to become uh, uh, very apparent. And there was a woman named, uh, actually her name was Lena Bryant, but now known as Lane Bryant, um, was really widely credited with st starting the first plus size um, a fashion line. Uh, and she opened her store in a small store in New York's Fifth Avenue, uh, probably one of the most famous shopping streets in the world. And she realized that there were women who needed clothing uh, that didn't fit into what was considered the regular size of the day. Um, and, and interestingly, um, you know, they were referred to at the time as uh, stout women, which, you know, you kind of have to chuckle at that when you see it now. Um, and, and the emphasis here was on slenderizing or, you know, disguising a body size and shape that what really was not considered as, uh, I'm doing air quotes here, regular, right? Um, the other thing that's fascinating to me about uh, Lane Bryant is that she actually measured, she was a real pioneer in data. She measured 4,500 of her own customers um, to help her create that plus size range. And she defined plus size as someone who had a bust measurement, and this is in inches, uh, between size 38 and 58. And I, as a data geek, also find it quite fascinating that she realized that not only could you be stout in a regular height, but you could also be short and stout and tall and stout. 
So, you know, really pioneering. And of course, again, it's kind of amusing to look at these images. Um, but, you know, it, it's important to note that, that, that this that didn't just start in the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, I think one of the most unfortunate things that was happening as the years went by, uh, as, as marketing campaigns tried to glamorize the slenderizing plus images, we see the models are actually getting smaller than they were in uh, the original intent. This is an image from 1954. And unfortunately, that kind of marginalizing and stigmatization continued over the decades. Uh, in the US in particular, uh, the, the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, plus size product did start to proliferate, um, maybe not on Fashion Avenue, but many other brands embraced it. Um, and also, uh, I should also note that in the 30s, uh, Evans in the UK uh, started out. The original name was Evans Outsized, which again is kind of a nod toward the fact that they were creating product for people who weren't fitting into that normalized um, uh, size range of the day. So what's, what's starting to change here? I think what's important to understand is today the emphasis is not on slenderizing or disguising your body. Today, the emphasis is on really uh, body positivity, uh, embracing who you are as a person. So, you know, the industry now is focused on this body positivity. Um, I think the seminal moment on this trajectory was in 2004 um, with this very bold and <clears throat> maybe controversial Dove campaign where uh, the message was really about rethinking uh, traditional assumptions about what makes one beautiful or what makes one's body image, uh, you know, self-important and not according to uh, definitions that other people might have for you. So this is really kind of where we're seeing a change. That was, like I say, 2004. And then over the last decade or so, you know, seeing these cultural shifts really in embracing diversity, um, you're seeing plus size models, not only, you know, on the runway or, uh, in print um, and, and starting to kind of destigmatize uh, the notion that people come in different sizes and shapes. And of course, you know, that's also a generational thing. Uh, millennials and younger, uh, these, are, these are groups of people that expect diversity in everywhere they look in society, whether it's religion, uh, whether it's race, um, and certainly uh, about body and, and shape. And, and, and they, they're just less judgmental of these differences um, that have happened uh, maybe in past generations. And, and brands and retailers cannot ignore that. They have to see that this is changing right in front of their eyes. And also think about, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, would you have seen uh, all these uh, beautiful people uh, at award shows in film and in television at the Grammys on the red carpet um, just owning and embracing, you know, who they are and being accepted widely uh, in the media. So, you know, brands and retailers who aren't seeing this and are not understanding uh, what has changed, um, this is really a, a big part of the backstory. So having said all that, um, uh, what is really, what, what do we see today when we're working with our clients uh, when it comes to brand approaches to the plus size market? Um, there's really, they kind of fall into three essential categories. Uh, number one, we have, you know, fashion brands, which really kill, kind of still uh, make decisions either to ignore or, you know, are very tepid about uh, entering or discussing it. And probably for good reason, because it, it does take a lot of effort and expertise to do this. This is not something that you enter into lightly. It's almost like starting in another total brand. So, you know, there's good reason why people would be cautious about entering that market. We have another group of, of customers um, are who have the startup nature, right? People who just get it, they're seizing the market opportunity and they're having a lot of great success. And then of course we have brands that have traditionally catered to this market, either specifically as a plus range or as an extension of their brand who are really working very hard to keep pace with the, the evolution of the landscape in terms of innovation and how uh, customers are, are, are uh, asking for uh, the product that they now demand because they simply have so many choices. Alice, welcome. Would you like to talk a little bit about how we might define plus sizes? 
Certainly. Thanks, Don. Um, when we start talking about plus, that can mean different things to different people. If you take a look at the industry definitions, um, it depends on who you ask. In the industry, a common response might be any size above a size 12. Um, that's uh, typically plus sizes have started at around a size 14. Um, all of this is changing though. Some people might tell you that it's the 16, 18, or 20, or even a higher size that's just part of an extended Missy size range and not really separate, just bigger. Traditionally, when brands have done separate or discrete uh, plus size ranges, about a size uh, 14 to 24 has typically been the range, but this is beginning to change. They're finding that there is demand for even larger sizes above a 24. You know, even a 20 going up to a size 30 is not unusual at all these days. And some brands will even go up to a size 40. The most recent ASTM standard actually does go up all the way to a size 40. And they're finding that there is demand for it. Yeah, Alice, I'm sorry to interrupt you. For our friends around the world, um, the reference points that we're giving you right now are US sizes. So sorry yes. that you might have to do the calculations in your head, but this is just for simplicity's sake, we're talking about US sizing. Exactly, thanks, Don. So when we go to um, other things that you need to think about, some other things that have changed is that plus used to be a niche market. Um, and we're finding now that as it becomes more mainstream, that people are beginning to talk about it in different terms. A lot of uh, women, particularly millennials, don't care for the term plus. They're thinking it's irrelevant. And some of the more innovative and progressive companies have started working on breaking down some of the barriers between what a lot of the, the plus bloggers call straight sizing and you know, not keeping the plus size parameters completely separate. They recognize that it doesn't make any sense to be exclusionary when it comes to bringing in um, women who are in sizes that make up nearly 40 to 60 percent of the U.S. population. And those numbers are not much less in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe and in South America. There are nearly as many full size women. Um, but there are some things about this that we have to think about. Even though many of the millennial bloggers prefer the word curvy, there are, um, there are some pros and cons about moving away from the word plus. Um, the reason that a lot of younger people don't like the word plus is that it has an historic stigma, stigma around bigger sizes. It may have been pushed in the back of a store or some brands only offered available online. And it's kind of made women who want those sizes feel marginalized. And that's why they've started to come up with different words to describe themselves. A lot of the bloggers in, in the plus world identify themselves as curvy or curved for that reason. Um, there are other terms that are, more, you know, that are older terms that might also be thought about if someone doesn't care for the word plus. Uh, full figured or women sizes have been used to separate them from smaller sizes. There is, however, another point of view on that. There's a woman named Rivka Baum, who's the founder of Slink Magazine, which is a magazine in Great Britain that is exclusively for plus size women. And her take on this is why drop the word plus? Brands are finally embracing it and reclaiming it and beginning to make fashion and recognizing that larger women want fashion. Why make it a dirty word now that everybody's decided that they're going to cater to it? Um, one of the other challenges about identifying plus, you know, as the word curvy is that women come in all sizes and shapes, regardless of what size you are, you might be curvy, you might have a straighter figure, you might have broader shoulders or broader hips. There's no, there's no one shape that really defines plus. So this creates a bit of a challenge for manufacturers and brands 
who are in the plus market. We certainly don't want to alienate our customers by segregating her away from smaller sizes, but we also want to let those consumers know that there are products that are designed and fit specifically for a larger figure without having a stigma associated with it. And the challenge, like we said, with the word curvy is that it connotates shape rather than size. <clears throat> it's, um, you know, it's a, that's a bit of a challenge. Don is gonna talk a little bit about the data in the market now. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Alice. Um, you know, data, as I said, is king. And, you know, what is data telling us about uh, this evolving market. Uh, you know, one of the most important things, as I mentioned earlier, is this is not a U.S. phenomenon. So if I look at this chart, uh, which is kind of a global snapshot at overweightedness and obesity prevalence, and this is from 2015, so let's say this is almost three years ago, um, for female adults who are over the age of 20, uh, the orange uh, indicates uh, uh, the percentage of overweightedness and the kind of turf uh, 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 bars represent obesity. So even in countries like Japan, China, Italy, and France, you're seeing levels of overweightedness, right? And then you see the traje trajectory that's occurring here um, with obesity. Um, most people thinking the U.S. is the number one obesity rate in the world, and that's simply not true. Saudi Arabia uh, has the highest rate of obesity uh, on the planet. And what does this tell me? It's very interesting to know that, you know, for someone who is overweight, that would give us an indication that there might be a need for bigger sizes in a regular range. But once you start to talk about obesity, that's when you're talking about the true plus size customer in terms of not only size, but the shape that's going to occur um, when someone is in fact obese. So not only is this a medical uh, kind of a terminology, but it's, it's an indicator of opportunity um, in the market. Um, you know, we can take this as granular as we want to get with it. I love this map. It's a heat map of the United States. And for those of you who don't live in the U.S. or not familiar with uh, a U.S. map, um, we can subdivide states by counties. So this heat map gets down to the county level for obesity prevalence for women. And on surface, you look and say, hey, you know, the light blues and the blues, that looks, you know, not so bad. But if you look at the legend at the bottom, uh, blues up until light blues represent a third, 20 to 30 percent obesity prevalence. And then you start getting into the 40, 50, where it starts getting yellow into orange. And then red is up to 60 percent of an obesity rate. So if you're a brand or a retailer in the U.S., you know, you can use this data to really start to look specifically at what opportunities might uh, be available for you um, in your uh, market. Um, also, you know, as I was noting, distinguishing between overweight and obesity, um, if you look at this chart, this starts to, to track overweight and obesity from 1960. Um, and this is U.S. women. And again, I'm, that's the, 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 the viewpoint that I'm going to take here. But this would not be dissimilar in many other countries in the world. And not only are we tracking overweightedness and obesity, but now we're talking about extreme obesity in this 30 uh, 30 um, in the in the purple. So, you know, this is where you're seeing this rise in proliferation uh, in the need for much bigger sizes than one might have currently imagined. And if you happen to be in uh, 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 the uniform business, you've known about this for a long time because you have what's known as a 100 percent fulfillment obligation. Uh, so, again, uh, for, for some people in the apparel market, this is not news. Back from a, a data point of view, um, I kind of like to, to show this chart. This is a scatter plot. This is our uh, data of U.S. women. So each and every one of those little dots is one person's body scan. And what we have here is from a data point of view, a very strong positive correlation when we compare the waist to the low hip. And again, forgive me, this is in inches for those of you who don't work in inches. But for illustration, I, I'm sure it serves the point. Um, and, and we can see here a general band of size and shape. People over here are bigger. People over here are smaller. People toward the top half of this chart have less or no shape. And people toward the bottom have uh, even more shape. But, but what's interesting, if you segregate it into what a size range might look like, uh, this is the opportunity uh, you're looking at uh, in plus size. It's... Um, 
sorry, I'm being too fancy with my cursor. Here's our plus size opportunity. If you were just simply to define on the low hip where a measurement would begin at say uh, 46. So again, using data uh, to define and quantify size and shape in general. And then of course, each and every one of these, this, this broad band of data here within that are subsets of different shapes. So um, you can kind of go nuts with this data and start to talk about it in many different ways. Um, but as I said, data is key and critical to understanding your target market, what sizes and shapes you would need uh, to be able to cover them effectively. Alice, you want to talk a little bit about some of the insight tools and strategy and some recommendations that we can share on plus size? Yes, and, and thanks, Don. Um, there are some things when you're, if you're developing plus size product as a, as a brand or a manufacturer that you need to think about that are quite different from developing smaller sizes. Um, they require a very thorough understanding of pattern making, and you've got to understand the shape of the plus body and how it differs from a Missy body. Um, a lot of brands, as Don was saying earlier, have kind of ignored or avoided entering into plus in, in spite of some of the compelling uh, market opportunity. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that there is, you know, quite frankly, a scarcity of skill sets in the world uh, both internally and at the factories. And that, when we talk about skill sets, it's not just the technical skill sets. It's, um, you know, merchandising, design, and technical pattern making skill sets. And one of the things that's happened as PLUS has begun to get a lot of traction as a market opportunity is while you've got um, a growing demand, you've also had a declining skill set. Um, most of the brands in the United States have delegated their pattern making to their vendors or their suppliers. And a lot of those factories are in places of the world where there's not a, a high rate of obesity. So you have kind of a dual challenge in that those people have no ex very little experience in developing product for a plus body. And they don't have the visual and social context that we have in Europe or in the United States. Um, so that's a, that's an opportunity there. Logistically, also plus apparel um, is more chal is more challenging than doing something like say a short or a tall pro product because it can't be done with mathematical conversions off of your basic you know Missy average height product. The balance has to be different. The styling and the construction and the proportions are all completely different from Missy. And having that technical capability and expertise are really key to success. Um, other things to think about is, you know, as we've been talking about the evolution of plus sizing, is that historically a lot of plus size standards were just bigger versions of a missy shaped body. Um, there's um, a lot of things that you need to think about. A missy size range can't just be graded up into plus. It gets to a point where it's it may be, a, you know, it might be a size that's appropriate for her, but it's not gonna deliver her a really good fitting uh, garment. They're, the uh, shapes and the balance are completely different. And this re applies to both the aesthetic and the technical proportions of the garment. You can't, you can't just take it at face value. A lot of things need to be different. These bodies here, what we see here is a good illustration of why that's so different. What you see here is the uh, mesh outlines of a form that's developed for a plus size and one that's developed for missing in the green. And you can see in the overlay that there's a lot more to the difference in these bodies than just the size. From a pattern making standpoint, what any pattern maker knows is that the more volume and shape there is in the body that you're fitting on, the more engineering is required to get a good fitting garment. You've got to think about darts and seam placements and opportunities to distribute that fullness in a way that's going to result in a clean, smooth fitting, comfortable garment. Um, there's a lot of things here, like say, for example, if you're looking at the overlay of these bodies, 
how much more projection is in the plus bust area and what might you need to do to a pattern in order to compensate for that. Um, sometimes there are some Missy product that don't have darts in them at all that you might want to add a dart or a seam. Um, a lot of different ways to think about that. That also has an impact on the balance of the garment because that relationship of the front volume and the distance that it takes to get over that is greater than the distance in the back, whereas in Missy, they might be more similar. Um, other things that might happen is you look at this and wonder, okay, how about the way the leg girth is distributed between that Missy and plus body, where the leg comes into the body on the plus, it's not just a different size, it's a different relationship of angles and proportions. Other things to think about is say, even the fullness of the belly on a larger body tends to have an impact on the way the pants will sit. Um, one of the common challenges you see in plus garments is when, they, when you're fitting pants, if you just take a Missy pant and grade it up, the fabric tends to fall down in the front and create a, a very unattractive pool of fabric right around the rise area. And you have, to, you have to accommodate those things with different pattern shapes. And it takes a bit of creative license to achieve that, um, both technically and aesthetically in order to accomplish that. You can't map it literally back to a Missy style. So Alice, how many times in your career did you have a designer or a merchant ask you to create a plus size woven blouse with no darts? over and over again, and then also not understanding, like say in a knit top, they wanna to get rid of the fullness in the armhole and spending literally decades trying to explain why that's not gonna happen. Um, and again, it speaks <laughs> to the necessity of having education in both design and merchandising to understand what you can and cannot do when you're trying to cover a shape that's completely different from a, from a regular size counterpart. Exactly, exactly. There are a lot of differences and um, there are, you know, simply, you know, patterns, as we all know, are flat pieces, are, are flat pieces of fabric developed from flat pieces of paper. And the more curved the shape is that you need to fit them on, the more engineering and the more, you know, like I said, kind of a creative license and interpretation and understanding is required in order to achieve a good fitting garment. Absolutely. You don't want to get rid of the fullness in the armhole and then create the whole garment hiking up in the front. You know, that's not a good trade-off. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Let's talk about overlaps. Sure. Um, one of the other things that brands need to think about is if they're offering both Missy and Plus product, um, there could potentially be an overlap of the size names, and there usually is. And there are a couple of ways you can address that. There's basically just, you know, two routes you can take. One is to have a continuous size range without any overlapping, but then in order to get a good fitting garment for the plus woman, you've got to reblock those styles at a larger size interval and then try to, you know, regrade back to meet in the middle. And that's one way you can tackle this and still serve the plus customer with a good fitting garment. The other way is to simply keep the two size ranges separate and have a rationale for the overlap in the naming. And there's no right or wrong solution for any brand. They, you know, both of these strategies, you know, have pros and cons. And the brand has to work through all of the all of those pros and cons to decide which route is best for them and how much of an overlap they might want. Here we have an example of what that overlap might look like. And what you see here is US, a typical US Missy size range, which runs from a US size four up to usually an 18 or a 20. And the kinds of measurements that are typical in the US for those sizes. The next thing that you see is a typical US plus size range. Most of them start at around a size 14W. Some start at a 12 or a 16, but 14 is the most common. And it will go up to a, you know, a size 24, 28, or, or even bigger than that. And when you put them both together, something interesting happens. What you see here is that in the sizes that overlap, 
between the 14 Missy and the 14 W and all the way up through the, you know, the 18, 16, you know, in the 20, that not only are they, they're kind of called the same thing, but that those measurements are really very different. And the shape of that body is different. So this is why, you know, a brand has to think about it. Carrying a 14 through a 20 in two size ranges means additional SKUs, but there might be a good reason for it, both, you know, both technically in terms of delivering an appropriate fit um, and also managing it internally. Here's an example of what a traditional plus size range looked like, going from like a, say, a 14 to a 24. And you can also see how not only does that body get bigger within plus within the plus range, but it also starts to change shape fairly dramatically. In the, the next illustration here, we show you the full ASTM plus size range, which starts at a 14 and goes all the way to a size 40. And again, when you look at just the 14 to the 24, you start to see some shape evolution as well as size evolution. This shows you really how dramatically the shape of the body changes when you start getting into very large sizes. And by the way, the illustration is meant to prove a point that these are opportunities in the market right now, and there are people who are seizing these opportunities. Thanks, Alice. Okay, well, we've done a lot of talking about uh, women, ladies sizing, right? Um, and, and that's fine because obviously uh, uh, the world revolves around fashion for women. Um, but some other things that might be important to understand uh, when you're thinking about additional plus size opportunity. If you remember the slide I explained to you earlier about the prevalence of uh, obesity for US women, what happens when I show you the same map for men? Wow, right? So uh, again, this map would not be unlike other countries in the world. Uh, so it's important to understand, you know, other places to look besides ladies fashion. Um, and let's face it, guys like to look good too. Um, and it's not surprising in the past a couple of years, there have been a few highly publicized plus size male fit models that have been signed to major agencies that notably in the UK, Germany and the US, which of course are countries uh, which some of the highest rates of obesity in the world occur for both men and women. So, you know, he wants to look good. His significant other wants him to look good. Um, so, you know, let's make sure we understand that there are other opportunities out there as well. And of course, along with that destigmatization of the population in fashion and print and media over the last several years, certainly uh, makes sense that we would start to see it occur for men as well. Uh, and again, a quick snapshot here, overweight and obesity prevalence. Uh, 2015 for adult males. And we see that same kind of trajectory for overweightedness, right? Which is probably why a lot of brands are, are offering bigger sizes in the regular range. But when you start getting into that, uh, sorry, when you start getting into the obesity uh, part of the equation, again, it's a similar thing for men. There's going to be different shapes that you have to accommodate uh, in size as well. So again, just another way to look at opportunity that might exist in your market. An another thing, a, a point I'd like to make right now about men's big sizes is you hear a lot about uh, big and tall being put together as a category. And again, this is a place where I like to go back to data to have that conversation. If I take a, a scatter plot of uh, height versus waist for US men, I have waist here along the side in inches and I have a height measurement. So shorter guys, taller guys, right? There is no positive correlation in the data that tells us that as you get bigger, you get taller, or as you get shorter, you get smaller. It would be a very neat trick, uh, but it doesn't work that way. So what this is meant to convey is that at any given height, you can have people who are bigger, or you can have people who are smaller. And you can correlate this with the chest and the low hip as well. But it's important when you're marketing and making product for your clients that big and tall do not necessarily go hand in hand. Someone could be big and tall, but not everyone who is big is tall. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, also, you know, obesity is not limited uh, to adults. 
Uh, and, and as attendingly, those size expectations are evolving. So to, if you're in children's wear and you're making children's product clothes for kids, you not, might need to note that the same phenomena is happening here. This is a UK example of, uh, you know, kind of a typical height and weight and the onset of puberty uh, in 1961 uh, versus 2011 for both boys and girls. And notably here uh, for young women, uh, you know, it's been documented widely that puberty, onset of puberty is happening earlier and earlier, which means her body is changing earlier and earlier, and her needs are going to change in terms of fashion and clothes. And unfortunately, the obesity epidemic is not uh, relegated to the adult world. Uh, this is from The Guardian, uh, May 30th, 2016, and it was a headline that one in three children aged six to nine in Europe are overweight or obese. So again, regardless of how you feel about the data or you feel about what's happening um, from a health point of view, uh, from a market point of view, in terms of creating apparel, these are opportunities that exist and they need to be addressed. And speaking about, you know, women, uh, tween product, anyone who creates product for people who are in between the, the teen years and the adult years are sometimes referred to as junior. Uh, in the plus market, this is really a conundrum. So as I've noted already, the onset of puberty continues to occur at younger ages, some studies documenting as young as the age of nine. So not only are they developing quicker, but you combine that with the obesity rates uh, and the earlier onset of puberty, you know, designing and merchandising and sizing product for girls between the age of 12 and 21 might be the single biggest challenge of the apparel industry. Uh, and, and, you know, again, I, I can revert back to our data set. Uh, we have two sets of, of robust data, one that might be about 15 years old, that's the one in the orange, and a more recent robust data set that might date between uh, 2012, 2014. And you can see very clearly in this chart that um, this is a female, U.S. females age 12 to 20. Okay, and again, the bust measurement along the bottom and the waist measurement along the size, this positive correlation of the data set. Um, and it appears to be that there's a much higher percentage in what we would call that junior plus category. So again, niche market, a lot of people there. Um, if you haven't considered it, you might wanna think about that if you're designing product for, for children or, or young adults. Um, so Alice, we've covered a lot of ground here. Is it time now to summarize some of our keys to success? Uh, yes. Um some of the things you nearly need to be to think about if you want to be successful in the plus market is first of all you've got to understand the size and shape of that tar target demographic and what are the sizes that she needs and how is it different from missy product uh, data can certainly help to quantify what that market opportunity is and that might be a little different from one region to another or even one brand to another depending upon who, you know who they're going after um, you definitely want to update fit standards and grade rules that are going to reflect what that shape looks like, both at your core size and across the size range. Because as we see, that shape, that shape does change much more radically in plus sizes than it does even within a Missy range. And you want to make sure that you've got the technical tools in place, that your forms and your blocks and your processes, quite frankly, are aligned in such a way that it's going to support that product and make it successful. Great, yes, thank um, you. And, and, and also remember, really importantly, creating plus size products successfully really requires expertise in design, pattern making, and merchandising. Many times we see plus size as a second thought or an extension, you know, grading your way into that area. But if you're gonna do it well and do it successfully, because there are a lot of people out there who are doing it well right now, you've got to kind of go there and, and dedicate the resources uh, to be able to, to create great product. Um, and a dedicated team for plus size would be considered a best practice. Um, carefully consider your stri sizing strategy. I hope we've illustrated to you and maybe opened some eyes for people uh, in what it really means in opportunity in plus size strategy. So, you know, that you could enter the market as a plus range only. And if you're doing that, you know, up to what size are you going to go? Um, are you prepared to accommodate much larger sizes? 
do you need to be everything to everybody? You know, what, what is your niche in that range and what are you trying to accomplish? Um, if you have a, a regular air quote, sorry, air quote, regular size range and a plus size range, how are you going to rationalize or maybe separate those ranges? Are you going to have separate sizes with an overlap, separate ranges, or might you consider using a continuous size range, um, which could be much more beneficial and also, uh, you know, streamline some of the operation? I think, but above all, and Alice, I'm sure you'll agree with this, uh, in the many years that we've been working in the plus size market, it is imperative that you embrace the customer. She does not want to be accommodated. You need to be able to tell her, we're here for you. We're creating flattering product that you want to wear and feel comfortable and feel fashionable and feel proud in. Uh, so don't enter this market unless you're totally willing to embrace he or she. Uh, on that journey. And I think that summarizes and, and concludes the body of the presentation. Uh, Heather, would you like to help us out? Do we have any questions that have popped up? Do we have any questions? We've got loads of questions, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> well, we had questions come in even before the presentation. So I've got a few in front of me with before I even started. So um, really big thank you to you both. It's been a really insightful presentation. And I did have the benefit of seeing a few of the slides before we started today. And I absolutely love the heat slide of the, the obese women in the US and then overlapping it with the men. It genuinely made me wow. And I'm sure most people thought the same. Incredible. Anyway, I digress. So um, do you think that fashion industry as a do you think that the fashion industry as a whole understands the diversity of plus size women's body shapes? There's a good one to start with. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I, I would say generally as a whole, there's um, a growing awareness about the diversity of shape. It's uh, still overall, I'd say that people are, are a little bit in the dark, but it's coming to light very, very quickly. And, and the um, availability of data around this and the demand in the market is uh, changing that very rapidly. Great, so, thank you. Um, it's on the move. Fantastic. Don, did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? Yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately, the reality is that the closer you get to what would be considered Seventh Avenue fashion or high street fashion, the least likely people are embracing the market opportunity. And I think that's a truism that most people would agree with, unfortunately. Definitely. Great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that the customer is conf uh, is confused by what she sees as sizing issues, many of which are body shape and fit problems? Well, we could take an hour on that one, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, a lot of a lot of what are seen as sizing issues is the result of some of the things we were talking about with people trying to grade their way up into plus instead of really understanding how the body is changing shape and creating product that really has a good technical qualitative fit to it. Um, because there are things that are happening as a result of trying to grade out of it that, that don't really fit, uh, even if they're big enough. Mm. Um, I, think, I think what's unfortunate, obviously, and any woman knows this, there's not a more confusing subject than sizing in women's oh. apparel globally. It, it, it's a global thing. And then when you start to introduce specialty sizing, and particularly when they start to overlap, it can be a really, really confusing subject. So, um, you know, I, 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 I do have uh, compassion for uh, women who are swimming around in that kind of, I'm, am I this size or that size in a regular range, let alone how to make sense of it when there's all these overlaps of size names that are occurring in the market. Definitely. It is a minefield for sure. Um, uh, have you seen evidence that the industry is doing enough to educate itself in this field? Um, I would say that, I, again, that it, that because of the, the clear market demand, the fact that uh, plus sales have grown over 17% in the last couple of years, as opposed to Bissy product, which has grown about 7%, that there certainly, um, there certainly is an effort for uh, the industry to try to get itself up to speed. Um, but there is also still a reticence because of some of the challenges and the investments and commitments that are taken that need to be undertaken in order to accomplish that. 
um, you know, we would definitely love to see more more of that happening. Don, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I think in terms of the expertise itself, you know, there's a there's a tandem decline in expertise in general. Um, and you know, 20, 30 years ago, when Alice and I might be involved in creating plus size product, there were dedicated teams. You wouldn't consider giving a plus size product to a pattern maker who didn't have any experience. You had a whole team of pattern makers that did nothing but plus size. So, you know, there's a general decline in uh, skill sets in industry, let alone in a specialty sizing arena. So I, I don't know that enough is being done to address that. Thank you. OK, this one is specifically mentioned to as Alice. So, Alice, you mentioned current ASTM regarding plus going up to uh, 40. It's my mm -hmm. understanding um, updating this range has been in committee for quite some time. Any idea when it may be updated? It was actually published and approved uh, just about a year ago. So it is out there. Okay. So, um, yeah, and there's there's a number of um, they develop standards for both um, two for two figure types, which is great. Um, you know, one that's a straight, you know, represents a straighter body and one that represents a curvier body. Mm -hmm. So they're already out there and. Um, you know, it's you can see from the screenshots, there was a lot of thought and effort that went into making it really representative of what bodies are shaped like at the, at those different sizes. Um, so anybody who wants to, you know, I'll put in a plug for ASTM, you know, <laughs> all of that information is available on their website as well. So, yes, the good news is it's there. OK, lovely. Thank you. Um, Another question here for Alice. Um, can you briefly describe the rise pattern shape difference between Missy and plus sizes? It's um, it is a good question. It, it's hard to do without visuals, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, what happens in I mean, obviously, the, the rise shape needs to be deeper, you know, because there's more girth from front to back. Um, but what also happens because uh, when someone has, is carrying extra weight, they have a belly which tends to push the front down. You generally have a different relationship of the height of the rise from the back to the front. It typically has to be a bit higher in the back to go over the additional weight that people put on in their seat and in the high hip, and then lower in the front to go underneath that belly so that you don't have all of that fabric being pushed down and creating you know, that very unattractive pool of fabric mm -hmm. right around the rise. And it's also very uncomfortable, but, you know, when you walk, there's extra fabric there. Um, so that roughly are the things to look for. Some of the angles have to be different as well. Um, and depends, you know, I mean, more specifically depends on the exact shape of the body that you're fitting to. But at a high level, those are the things I would look for. Great. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. Without the benefit of visuals, that was excellent. Um, okay. Uh, somebody else has put here, seems this presentation is based only on women. What's your experience looking into men's plus sizes? Can all this be adopted into men's or does your experience tell you otherwise? All right. Well, uh, thank you for asking about the men. And, you know, we, 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 did, we needed to keep it kind of focused because if we got all over the place, we would have taken much more than an hour. Um, but in principle, when you start to delineate between one who would be considered a plus size guy and a regular range guy. It's the same principle when it comes to size range and reblocking. There's a point at which in a range that you, you get to the place where you need to start over again exactly like you would uh, in plus. So in that way, some of the principles are the, are the same. Um, but again, if you were to see some of the visuals, I'm not sure if I have any that I could share with you, but uh, you know, the same reference points that we talked about, uh, you know, in terms of a guy getting bigger. This is, uh, you know, kind of, again, U.S. nomenclature where the uh, chest measurement is the size name. You know, once you get up to size 56, you know, the body is just completely different in size and shape. Um, and again, kind of owning back to that ASTM big men lineup, there's no shortage of challenges in uh, creating product for the men just like they are for the women. So in principle, kind of the strategies might look the same. Um, obviously, the technical realities are going to be a little bit different. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for thanks for finding out those slides so quickly. That was great. Um, OK, do you have any idea? 
sorry, do you have any data to back whether plus size customers tend to be more loyal than the average? I don't know that we would say that the plus customers are more loyal than Missy customers. I think that in general in the market, what you see is that if you create good fitting product and you deliver on it consistently, consistency is the key to customer loyalty, especially when it comes to fit. Mm. You know, we always say it's it's the design and the fashion that gets them in the door. It's the fit that brings them back. Um, I don't know that it's different for, for anybody. I think, you know, one of the whole points in the messages here is that regardless of size, all people want and need the same things from their clothes and from fashion. Definitely. So, I mean, somebody's put here, awesome overview. Thank you. So I'll pass that on to you as well. Do you have any data on the Australian plus size market that you could share? I don't have any that I could share, but I do have data. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe that's one to um, to look at off offline because that would maybe yeah. be best. Okay. Um, and how big is the kids or teens plus size market at the moment? Alice? Um, again, we I don't have specific data to quantify that. I will tell you that the the rates of overweight and obesity are increasing among tweens and younger people, as we were saying before. And it is a growing market and it's a very important market. Um, you know, we would have to, you know, do a little data mining to actually quantify that. I think that the chart that Don is pulling up here now shows that it is definitely on the increase. As you can see here, the purple dots represent newer data. Um, so this shows you the evolution of that market over a period of time. Mm. You know, and again, we could take it offline if we wanted to dig a little deeper into that one. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to call us and we'll be happy to help you on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the, the details, if you do want to get back in touch with uh, Alvin on, if you have a burning question that you've not thought to ask today, then obviously the details are on the screen now um, and they'd be happy to help you, I'm sure. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left, so let's find a couple of questions. So um, do you feel that the plus size market sector is being held back as a result of not providing a more informed range of fits? I would say I would say yes. I think when you look out there, there are still a lot of brands that have some old preconceived notions about what plus is. Um, probably not offering offering larger sizes, like we said historically, that you know plus sizes have stopped around a 24, and a lot of brands still do stop there. Even and I, that they're missing opportunity because there there are an increasing number of people who want sizes bigger than that. Um, and I think that a lot of brands either, you know, either they don't want to tackle it or they're not aware of it. I'm not sure, you know, you know, if it's a chicken or the egg situation there, um, you know, and also, again, understanding that not not only is that core plus body a different shape than your core Missy body, but that that shape changes radically over the range of sizes in plus. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there, you know, there could be a little more done. Okay. No, 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 no. It's saying it goes to the question, you know, it goes to the question, has the industry really done enough to educate itself? And there's, there's definitely a lot more to be done. Indeed. Don, did you want to add anything to, to that one? No. Um, and again, overall message here is opportunity. Yeah. Uh, there are people who are doing it well and with great success. So, you know, you know, it, it, there's enough success out there to point us in the direction to know that this is not going anywhere. Um, this is going to be ahead of us for years to come. Uh, so, you know, hopefully, you know, the information that we provided today uh, might have been enlightening. Uh, hopefully it shed some additional light for those who are interested and any experts on the call that were listening, maybe that they got a little bit of a different perspective mm. uh, on the market and, and, and again, how we might look at things and approach them. So, you know, this is not going anywhere. It's here to stay. Absolutely. OK, so one more question before we wrap up. Um, in view of the huge proportion of e-commerce uh, e product returns, do you think that this market is in need of, in, of enhanced methods in pairing the correct customer with her necessary or preferred fit? 
Uh, absolutely, 100 percent, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and again, to Alice's point, this is a challenge for many retailers is what we would call fit messaging, fit and size messaging. You know, mapping what a customer's expectation is to what you have actually created and produced. And there's so, so many disconnects that exist in the market right now. Uh, so, you know, if a, a tip to anybody, not only in the product that you're creating right now, uh, we call it the, the kind of the trilogy is setting out uh, to create product that you believe in, um, faithfully executing to that product, and then explaining the customer, what did you just do and what are you providing for them? So, of course, in, in plus size, that's going to create a lot of challenges, but the, the field is wide open um, to, to do a better job. So almost anyone can up their game on that because there's mm -hmm. nothing more disappointing than thinking that you're getting something and having it not meet your expectation and then having to return it. Definitely. I think we've all been there at some, some point in our lives. <laughs> so thank you very much, Don and Alice, and to all the team at Alvanon for preparing such a great uh, presentation. We've had lots of compliments uh, through the questions box, so you'll be uh, you'll be great to um, be looking forward to seeing all those, I'm sure. And sorry to everybody who we didn't manage to get through um, your questions for um, that we've had loads. So it's been really, really good. Um, thank you. As always, I appreciate that everybody spent some time out of their day to, to view this webinar. And that remains to say that thank you very much to everybody um, and hopefully hear from Alvin on again very soon.